Welcome to AIJ Philadelphia Design Conversations. I'm Bernardo Margulis, and today I'm speaking with Alan Espiritu. Alan is a Philadelphia-based, award-winning graphic designer and educator. He is a founder of GD Loft PHL and heads the graphic design concentration at Rutgers University Camden. He was president of AIJ Philadelphia between 2011 and 2013, and is this year's AIJ Philadelphia Fellow Award recipient. Hi, Alan. How's it going? I'm good. I'm all right. How are you? This is the fun part when you I switch know. to the recording. Thank you for being with us yeah. on Design Conversations. We're very excited to have you here. And I have a few questions about your work, about your career. Sure. So let's get started. Yeah. In addition to running GD Loft, you're also a teacher. Yeah. Um, and you constantly hire former students, current students. Mm-hmm. Your business partner right now is Kevin yeah. Kernan, who's a former student. Right. How does your teaching influence your practice? And how does your practice influence your teaching? Well, at, at first, like, you know, when you first start teaching, you go, oh, the you know, the, the teaching is not really going to influence the making at all. But, uh, you know, it, it, that is such a wrong um, perspective on it. At least that was my thinking when I first started teaching. It, it totally influences the way I design. And they, it's like a symbiotic relationship between the two things. Um, teaching informs my practice. My practice informs my teaching. And, and if I, I can't actually even picture not teaching anymore because it really is kind of fodder for, for work. The conversations I have with my students are actually kind of like, and the questions I have for them are kind of almost refl- questions that I have for my own kind of process, right? It's almost like, you know, when you're critiquing their work, you're, you're also critiquing yourself in some ways because you've taught these guys. But it, it is an important part of it. But I'm not going to say it's easy. I think it's very, very difficult. It, it's still something that's challenging to me, the balance between the actual time teaching and running a studio is is really, really difficult. Like, I don't think I've ever... I haven't come to terms with that kind of thing. I'm just kind of very reactive. I design while... Like usually, I'm well, if I'm teaching, I design during lunch. How many days a week are you at school? How many days I'm a week there are you here? Twice a week, and I teach from usually nine till three thirty. The only time I have is usually um, my uh, my lunch, but I'll de- be designing, or I'll be on the phone, or I'll be calling one of these guys about like, oh, how's that project going? Or if the kids have like a, a lab time. While they're working, I'm working too, and then they can get me if they need me, but like I'm in the same space working with them. I think educators with practices are, I'm there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sure you guys know. You, you kind of have to, you kind of have to do what you have to do. And the thing about um, the place that I'm at, I'm at Rutgers, so Rutgers is a research institution. They really, really, um, you know, they want you to be doing work more than a teacher, on, mm-hmm. than being a teacher. They actually, the way that you're evaluated for tenure and things is, is about your research more than it is your teaching, unfortunately. But the belief is that if you're a maker or if you're practicing what you are teaching, then automatically you should be able to be uh, able to transfer that information to, to your students in some ways. And the idea is that, you know, students are kind of working with professors in their actual research and their actual actual practice. Well, it's such a practical career. Uh, The fact that you can tell them about your real life projects probably is very helpful rather than just hypothetical. Yeah. Oh, well, I think it's it's so important in a field like graphic design. I think you have to be a practicing designer to teach. You know, I think... um, you know, I, I, it's just a belief of mine that you have to have that applied skill to kind of like um, be able to kind of transfer that knowledge to, to your students. So it's an important part of design. Yeah, the theoretical, but the applied is just as important. You know? Now, you started at Rutgers, that was your undergraduate. Then you went on to Yale for your master's in fine arts, and then you came back to Rutgers to teach. To teach. How that has that changed since you were there? Do you feel that you should follow the current line or the existing line, or are you trying to innovate there? How is that process going back? Well, it, it was really interesting. I mean, 
I, you know, this sounds kind of crazy, but I know most people go back for their masters to teach. I had no desire to teach, actually. Why did you go for it? I, I wanted because I was working in the field for ten years, and I needed, I needed something in my process to change, or else I just didn't want to do design anymore. There had to be something that was gonna. You know, you work for 10 years in graphic design and you're doing like these kind of, I mean, I started out doing coupons. I worked, my first job was money mailer. And I talk about this all the time. Um, making coupons for money mailer really, you, it, you know, when I had the job, I didn't think, oh my God, I'm good. I'll be here for six months and go. But it was, a mo I, I was only there for less than a year, but it was one of the most influential jobs I've had actually, because it really kind of created a perspective on design for me. Um, I have a problem being a designer, honestly. I have a big problem, like I said this in this talk, I just gave a talk at the Barnes Museum the other day and it's about the fine artwork, but a lot of my work is about critiquing graphic design and it's being and and me having a problem with being this kind of uh, you know a co commercial pusher like pushing because you know my first experiences with design was making coupons and creating ads for like automotive places and i'm like who gives a shit about this stuff? Is this what I'm going to be doing my whole life? Thank God I wasn't there for so long. But <laughs> And then I went into advertising for a little bit, which was also an awful experience. I was, I, it was the only job that I've ever, ever walked out on. I just kind of said, I, I was a good worker. I was, I was great, actually, I think. I just couldn't live with myself doing what I was doing, like creating advertising for things that I, had, I could care less about. I think they were nice looking, but I couldn't care less about it. You have an art director like thinking about all these marketing things, and I'm like, I don't care. I really don't. I don't care. In my head, I'm saying that, but I, I get it done. Um, but I walked out um, of a job and said, look, I, I just couldn't take it anymore. And it's nothing against you. It's just what I do. And they were like, fine with it, but they really wanted me to stay. And, I stayed actually for, I, I was freelance for another month and I was like, I can't do it. <laughs> I was like, I have to go. So how did going to grad school? So going that? to grad school actually opened up, opened me up to, you know, this kind of critical part of me about what I do. They actually, they're like, that's great. Okay, here's, let's, let's kind of talk about this. Let's, um, here's some things to kind of look at. Um, Yale is, Yale's very theoretical. I, I was not theoretical before then. Um, what they expose you to a lot of critical writing. They they expose you to like to very much critical thinking. Um, but the but the theory part of it happens like your first year there. You're just kind of immersed in these these things that, depending on who your advisor is, they. You know, they give you all these readings to just kind of think. Even before before you come to the program, they give you a reading list. You have to read Foucault. You have to read Guy Debord. You have to read like all the uh, Walter Benjamin. Um, uh, all these people I had no idea who were they were, but like later on, I mean, I can say now have have really influenced me. But I can tell you when I was reading, I'm like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> I just don't understand it. And then when you kind of have um, Discuss, you, know, you start to have discussions and you just kind of start to see that theory kind of like start to be embedded in your work. And for me, like being at Yale, um, I was lucky. I mean, everyone there, like most of the professors were European. Um, and I was highly influenced by my direct thesis advisor, which is this guy, Paul Elman, who's just kind of like hidden character in, in design. He doesn't I don't think he wants to be known as a graphic designer. He definitely is that line between graphic design and um, and and fine art. While other people had like you know Michael Rock by two two by four, who's who's a highly critical um, design writer, but he's also a beautiful maker. You know, like and then you had Alan Horry, who's from Cranbrook, who's also a beautiful maker. I, I, the, my my thesis advisor happened to be a lot more conceptual and really kind of was in this kind of like blurred world between whatever design could be. He didn't even really call it design. Yeah. 
So I think this is a good segue for the next question. Yeah. Um, in the design world, we talk a lot about, is this art or is this design? Some people yeah. do art and call it design. Some people do design and call it art. Yeah. But your work truly merges both of those areas. Um, you know, Thanks. We, we have, for example, you did the PDA catalogs uh, in 2008, where yeah. every cover was different, a different color, and you created a sculpture. Yeah. Um, for the Pew uh, Institute, you did the catalog for yeah, No Ideas yeah, to Ridiculous, different. where every folio is different, is a different color, a different size, just yeah. to create that immersive experience. Can you tell us about this idea of merging art and design? Do you feel that you're consciously blurring the lines? Do you feel that there are no lines? I don't know if like I'm consciously doing it. All I know is that I want, um, you know, design to just be different. I want design to be immersive. I want, I, I don't want to make it, it again. It comes from this theory, um, Walter Benjamin's writing about aura. Like, so in aura, he, his definition, or at least my interpretation of his definition of aura is that, you know, if it's reproduced, the thing doesn't have as much aura as an original, right? So a, a painting has aura because it only exists once. And any reproduction of that painting has no aura because it's, it's not, it doesn't have that kind of intangible quality that the original has. So as a graphic designer, I had a real problem with that. Like I spent hours making a stupid flyer that someone could throw away and it's reproduced a thousand times so like to me it was like so you're telling me what i do has no aura has no value and i have a problem with that that's where it really comes with that's one of the problems with graphic design i have a problem with that kind of mass production does it does it have no value um because it's mass produced i just make so my whole intention is to make work with some type of aura. Can each piece then feel like an original? Can each piece have some value um, that, you know, Walter Benjamin's telling me that it doesn't, you know? Um, so I'm kind of reacting to that. And maybe that is the fine art part of, of my work. I take like kind of fine art theory and methods and put it and put it into design it's not so much aesthetic it's definitely about like how like the the kind of methodology or the co concepts in fine art and i try to kind of bring it into design you know and that's how i think maybe that's how i merged the two worlds of, of design and fine art at so, least in my head so is there anything specific that you do to create that aura or do you think it's for every piece it's not it's definitely not for every piece i mean you have to kind of um you, you have to write find, like anything you have to find the right client you have to write, find the right project i mean we do a lot of work for uh you arts um and you know t deadlines are like sometimes at the end of the day you get it in the beginning of that how much can you kind of think about that but you do think about like little things how do you how do you create this to be a little different than the, the things that are out there, you, maybe you think about um, format, you know, you, or you think about like, can that add any value to someone, you know, can, can you think about like the kind of um, production qualities to something that's simple to think about um, that that can add um, an, another layer to something that, you know, um, add some value to it, you know. I don't know if that's clear, but but it doesn't happen on every project. We, there's just realities of constraints that sometimes don't allow you for that. And how do you feel in those cases where you can't do it? Is it okay because it's yeah, bills, think, or is it okay because you can't do it every time? I mean, in reality, you it has to pay. You know, you have to pay bills at some at some point. Um, yeah, it can't be all the time though. I think it's a balance. It's something that we kind of uh, struggle with. You know, as the studio gets bigger, as you hire people, as you have to pay people, you know, the, you have to weigh those values a little bit. The value is always going to be there. It's, you know, you have to know when you're going to give up those values and for how long. Like, I couldn't give it up for, like, three years, you know? Like, I have to say, okay, 50% of the jobs have to kind of fit into this, like, something that that's really kind of valuable for us. And then... 
50% of the jobs just have to be these things that, yeah, we're going to try to think about it in this way, but in some cases we can't, we have to let go of it, you know, and just kind of get the work done. We're, we're in a field where we have clients, yeah. you know, so it, there is a balance. Um, and that's why maybe I make, other work, self-initiated works, right? As a reaction to clients or a reaction to projects or um, that you don't have time to think about. And usually those those projects that I get really frustrated about are kind of an impetus to make like self-initiated things. A lot of it is, honestly. My hatred of like working with clients <laughs> sometimes it becomes a prompt to make, oh, I should think about this. like. There's something interesting in there, and I start to develop work around that kind of stuff. Yeah. So you take your frustration out <laughs> on your own personal work. Yes. <laughs> yeah, if, and, and the personal work is a critique of, like, my world and, like, my clients sometimes. And it, it's, yeah, it's funny. It starts that way, and then it becomes like, oh, wait, that's really interesting. Oh, that's really interesting. I'll, I'll read a little bit of theory and then combine that into it. And... Like, yeah, it's it's kind of an interesting process. It's definitely, like, kind of fluid. It's like, I'll just get an idea for, you know, a fine art piece or whatever, a self-initiated piece while I'm, I'm working on client work. All the time, it just kind of works that way. Yeah. The Barnes yeah. Foundation, they invited you to participate in Person of the Crowd, the Contemporary Art of Flannery. Yeah. They invited 50 artists from the U.S. and from abroad, including Marina Vermovic, Guerrilla Girls, and Ed Rocha. And they ask artists to take the streets to talk about topics such as fetish, fetishism, gentrification, and gender politics. Yep. And about your specific project, yeah. uh, the Barnes Foundation says that it situates itself at the intersection of graphic design and fine art and raises provocative questions about the commodification and fetishization of desire. Yeah. Uh, GDUSA describes the project uh, by saying the works avoid traditional pictorial representation Instead, choosing language and typography as a mode of expression while visually referencing the oversaturated, repetitively abundant American pop culture landscapes that bombard people every day. Yeah. Very strong words <laughs> to describe Please. your fine art project. Um, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Can you tell us about this project titled over and over? What was your inspiration? What were your goals for it? How did you work on it? Yeah, um, it's good because I just spoke about this. At the <laughs> and so I've, I've been able to kind of filter this thing in. But um, first, it's so damn exciting and I'm so honored that I'm in such crazy company in this show. I mean, and a lot of it are heroes of mine and fine art. Sophia Cal is in there. I don't know if you know her work. It's like, I mean, for me, it's about uh, nonfiction meets fiction, life meets non-reality and, and ways how she documents it, like in, in, in the city. I mean, they have works from Guy Debord, who was a huge inspiration in terms of like, the, the in terms of the situationist um, international kind of art movement that I'm really um, I, I, I say I come from that lineage so the, just to how this whole project started um, again I, I'm influenced by the situationist movement and the situationist movement to base, in a basic nutshell they wanted to bring creativity back into everyday life and this was happening in the 50s and 60s, you know, when the rise of commercialization and industrialization and, um, and um, you know, a lot of things were just changing in the 50s and 60s. And what they were noticing were cities were just kind of falling apart and becoming segregated. So they wanted to, in reality, wanted to create a revolution where they would bring creativity back. And also they didn't want people to, to fall under the control of, of commercialism. This was the rise of, of consumerism and people were being enamored by conveniences and and buying, you know, like like the way we live now. iPhones and Facebook and like and, and they're trash cans with batteries. And but... trash cans with batteries. <laughs> Look at that. Um, but what they were were saying was, you know, advertising and marketing are creating this artificial reality that's blocking you from living your real life. And, and so they were against this. And, and uh, one of the ways they would do this is um, they would create derives. This is a theory that they've created, uh, a methodology. It's about um, 
It's about kind of wandering, which is what this show at the Barnes is about. It's about wandering and um, in the city and being inspired by, by that wandering. But it really comes from like situationist theory and this thing called derive, where their thing was get lost in the city, lose all your original intentions and give yourself back for a minute, get yourself back for the minute. And they would make methods like uh, Guy Debord would cut up uh, the map of Paris and randomly put them together and say, here, use it. And, and it was a way for tourists to kind of get lost. Or that he would give maps of London for Paris and he would have people think, you know, follow. And the, the, the point is, in losing yourself, in being distracted, in, in that new experience, you get a whole new experience of life. You get a new experience of the city. You see things that you've never seen before, or you look at things in a different perspective. So this work kind of comes from that. Um, and, you know, like the pieces that I've done for the barns, like I said, it, I'm not here to be a graffiti artist or a wheat paster. I learned to wheat paste for this project and and because the idea was to pay homage to the Situationist movement. In 1968, they took over the Sorbonne and they took over the art department and they made posters. They started silk screening posters and they started wheat pasting all around the city. So for me, I wanted to take that methodology and make it kind of a homage to the to, to Situationist movement. So that's why at first I'm using um, wheat pasting as, as part of the method. But in terms of the language and where this comes from, it's a critique of, of kind of marketing and consumeristic control through the lens of pop music. So these are pop lyrics. Um, and, and, you know, pop lyrics usually are throwaway things. We, we, we don't think about them as much. And I love the idea of taking something that we throw away and then making them more meaningful. So when people come to them, like I've had people come up to them, like not really knowing where they come from and say, wow, this is really inspirational or the language really talks to me. I mean, but words like, you know, I hear you whisper softly to me or one of them says, I was so blind, I cannot see. So it, on the surface level, they are inspirational, right? They, they can do that. But for me as the artist or the maker, it's actually more ominous than that. I chose lyrics that actually talk about the control of marketing has over us or consumeristic control, or it's about, it, it's definitely about psychological control. So for me, these become everyday mantras to remember that like, hey, you're under everything you do from going to Facebook, from, from buying this on Amazon, you're under some type of control. And that's okay that you are, but know that you are. And then that gives you a little bit more power. So these, are, these statements for me are actually mantras to remind me that like, don't remember, you're always under some type of marketing or consumeristic control. But um, so it's OK if you are, but know that you are. Right. And that gives you a little bit more of that. It gives you more of the power. But for the surface level, most people look at it as, as just kind of these inspirational things, which pop culture is, which consumerism is. I mean, I also connect these lines to uh, t uh, uh, marketing slogans, just like just do it. I started studying the the language structure of pop music and comparing it to the language structure of marketing campaigns and 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 slogans like just do it what happens here stays here um be the uh, you know i'm loving it uh you know these things that are connected to these everything so i'm making this kind of comparison to that as well and then the 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 visual comes from marketing i mean colors are all about control right it really sucks you in um the the historically the typefaces that i've chosen from cooper black to uh you know to an impact of futura to uh they they kind of talk about um mark they talk about uh media culture so things that are related to headlines things that have religious influences i i, I use typefaces that kind of um uh, kind of uh, connote uh, circus because so all these things for me is a, a reflection of our everyday visual landscape this is what we see every day not really kind of knowing it it's a mishmash of all these influences so that's where the work kind of comes from and um, 
it, and it's it's been a series of things and the the point of this too is also about aura like he says again walter benjamin says the more you make something the more it loses aura and my point with this is the more i make it it takes forms of cups and the barns made these mugs and they made magnets and they made journals and they made t-shirts and i've made them in the light boxes and stickers and i think I, I contest that. I say it has more power the more you mass produce like something. So that's kind of the ideas in a nutshell. I know it's kind of long, but that's, that's the idea. <laughs> well, it makes it easier for me because you've answered all my follow-up questions. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. <laughs> I mean, yeah. So that's where the kind of um, that's where the project comes, and it continues to grow. And every time I start to think of what's the next piece for this, or how does it kind of grow, and the and the forms it takes in terms of like its size and things are always related to graphic design. So the wheat paste piece is eight and a half by eleven. The other ones, um, uh, eleven by seventeen. They're they're always sizes that I connect to kind of graphic mm -hmm. design, you know, or or media culture or things that we're exposed to almost every day. So, yeah. Yeah, IGA Philadelphia recently announced that you're the recipient of the 2017 Fellow Award. We're going to celebrate on May 5th, and this yeah. is the biggest award any chapter can give to yeah. a member. You're, getting, you're being awarded for your service to AIGA. Uh, you've been a member for 20 years. You served on the local board of directors. You were chapter president from 2011 to 2013. You helped spearhead the opening of the chapter's first headquarters space. You were instrumental, instrumental in bringing AIJ National Retreat to Philadelphia in 2013. Uh, you're no longer on the board, but you're still very active. And I'm not even talking about your outside awards and your outside publications. What moved you to get so involved with the design community? And what does it mean to you that this community is now rewarding you for all your service? Well, I mean, first of all, it's a, it's a huge honor. I mean, I think... You know, it's one of those things that you could only dream about. I think as a young designer, you go, oh, maybe I'll make it. You know, you could hope you make an influence in such a field that's like, that's so ubiquitous. I mean, there's so many graphic designers. And I'm not saying I'm, I'm influential, like, beyond, you know, internationally or whatever. But at least, you know, I've made an impact in, like, my area. That's I think that's that was really important to me. I think I think you we all come to a part of your a, our career where we want to kind of give back, um, and I definitely hit that. And I was like, well, I just want want to be involved. Um, and and it's important to have um, um, a group of people that you can kind of commiserate with and kind of talk. Uh, you know, too, about uh, what you're going through as designers. And I, that's what I wanted at first. You know, I wanted to just ha um, have have friends that I can kind of talk about with because you can't go home and talk about graphic design. <laughs> oh, my wife was, does anesthesia, you know, when I talk about, and she does it to pediatrics, to kids. So when I talk about the fucking printer messed up the color, she's saying, well, you know, a kid died today and, you know, and I'm like, okay, well, I'll just shut up right now. You know, I mean, the, the it's just like apples and oranges. But... You know, AIGA, I can go and say, hey, look, the printer is totally screwed up the size of the book, and they, they can commiserate with me. But at the same time, you know, like, um, I also wanted to, I wanted a group of people, or maybe uh, have some people, like, kind of think about design beyond, like, what we do from the personal, you know, from the commercial level to something a little bit more personal. And AIGA allows me to do that. Um, if you want to put in the time and the effort, you can do whatever you want. You just get, here's the budget though. And you can do whatever you want. But um, it's, it's, it's quite an honor to be uh, given this award. And it's nice to know that, um, you know, like you kind of make some type of effect. You're not going to affect everyone, but at least you've affected at least the group of friends that you've been surrounded with, you know? Um, and I, I continue to be, I continue to be active. I think it's also part of my practice to be able to kind of, I think, especially in my future works that I see, I, I definitely want um, some type of community engagement with, with like graphic design or mixing the two worlds together, graphic design and community engagement and, and, and things like that. So I don't think I'll ever not be active in graphic design.
I mean, in the AIGA, I just can't see me ever disconnecting. Unfortunately. Well, and you're the poster boy of being a positive influence in the design community in AIGA. So <laughs> oh, thanks. thank you for all your contributions. Well, thank you. Uh, and thank you for That's chatting nice. with us about your career and about your work. Oh, wow, thanks. Congratulations on the award. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alan, for sharing your design journey and philosophy. Thank you, Sean Hamann, for helping us document this conversation with photography, which you can see through our website. And thanks to Ryan Evans for providing the serious music. For more info, please visit philadelphia.aiga.org or find us on social media. And join us in celebrating Alan as our chapter's fellow award recipient. The party will be May 5th, 2017 at the Warwick Hotel in Philadelphia. And tickets are available through philadelphia.aiga.org. Thank you.